I am Andy Teach, host of Andy's Awesome Adventures, and welcome to Dublin, Ireland. In the merry month of June, when first from home I started, left the girls in tune, so sad and broken hearted, saluted father dear. Kiss me, darling mother, and drank a pint of beer. Grief and tears to smother the off to reap the corn. Blame for I was born, caught a stout black tar to banish ghost and gobble and ball to pair of bugs. Rattle over the bugs, frightened all the dogs on the rocky road to double and one, two, three, four, five. Hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road. All the way to double and white fell out he ran. There were a hair sing. When and Mullen gathered night, I rested limb so weary, started by daylight. Spirits bright and dairy took a drop of the pure. Kept me hard from sinking, that's the paddy's cure. Here he's on for drinking to see the lassie smile, laughing all the while. At me curious style, would set her heart to bubble and asked if I were hurt. Wages I required, I was almost tired of the rocky road to double and one, two, three, four, five. Hump the hair and turn her down the rocky road all the way. After getting no sleep on a red-eye flight from JFK Airport in New York, my brother, two of our nieces, and I hit the ground running. Our first stop was the Christ Church Cathedral, also known as the Cathedral of the Holy Trinity. This Protestant cathedral is located in the heart of medieval Dublin and is Dublin's oldest building. It was originally founded in the late 11th century, but was extensively renovated and rebuilt in the early 19th century. More renovations were carried out in the 1980s. The cathedral features a combination of Romanesque and Gothic architecture. The Romanesque characterized by rounded arches and windows, thick stone walls and semicircular shapes, and the Gothic characterized by pointed arches, spires, pointed turrets, and a rose window. This is the Homeless Jesus statue, a work by Canadian sculptor Tim Schmaltz. It's a seven-foot cast bronze park bench, depicting Christ hidden beneath blankets, his identity known only by the holes in his feet. It was designed to prompt public reflection on the plight of the homeless. The cathedral's interior is Gothic in style with many Victorian accents due to 20th century restoration and redecoration. The pointed arches are characteristically Gothic. This is the reputed effigy of Richard de Clare, second Earl of Pembroke, also known as Strongbow, a medieval Norman Welsh warlord whose arrival marked the beginning of Anglo-Norman involvement in Ireland. In 1562, the nave roof vaulting collapsed and Strongbow's effigy was smashed. The current effigy is a contemporary replacement. It is believed that his body may be buried somewhere in the cathedral walls. There is no unrighteousness in it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As God to be within, is now and shall be forever for him. Please sit to the reading. And all the six hundred Gittites who had followed him from Gath passed on before the king. Why are you also coming with us? Go back and stay with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile from your home. Go back and take your king's folk with you. Where are the bones? Christ Church Cathedral also contains the largest cathedral crypt in Britain or Ireland, which is about 200 feet long. While I was expecting to see a lot of bones and skulls, this 12th century crypt actually contains priceless silver and Ireland's first copy of the Magna Carta. The original Magna Carta was written in 1215 in England and it established that executive power should not be above the law. This is a 14th century copy.
Well, back of me is the Molly Malone statue. It's based on a famous 19th century song. Molly Malone was a fishmonger. She sold fish during the day and was a prostitute at night. But unfortunately, she died of a fever at a young age. Now, it is supposed to be good luck to rub her bosoms. Uh, so many people have done that. The bronze actually has worn off the statue. You gotta do it while you're in Dublin. I should get a lot of good luck. In Dublin's fair city, where the girls are so pretty, I first set my eyes on sweet Molly Malone. As she wheeled her wheelbarrow through the streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, crying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh. fishmonger and sure twas no wonder for so were her father and mother before and they wheeled their burrow through the streets broad and narrow crying cockles and mussels alive alive oh alive alive oh alive Crying cockles and muscles, alive, alive, oh. She died of a favor, and sure no one could save her. And that was the end of sweet Molly Malone. Now her ghost wheels her barrow through the streets broad and narrow. Crying cockles and muscles, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, crying cockles and muscles, alive, alive, oh. The Easter Rising of 1916, also known as the Easter Rebellion, was an armed insurrection in Ireland during Easter week, April 1916, which lasted for six days. The Rising was launched by Irish Republicans to end British rule in Ireland and establish an independent Irish Republic. It wasn't until the end of 1922 that the Irish Free State, later renamed Ireland, became independent of Great Britain with the exception of Northern Ireland. You're on. So we're here at um, the uh, Kill M. Gull and Courthouse to pick up Lauren because she got arrested last night <laughs> underage <is>. drinking. <laughs> so we're here to bail her out. We're here at Kilmainham Jail, which is yeah. spelled G A O L. And in 1916, in Ireland, there was the Easter Rising or Easter Rebellion. And the rebels were fighting for independence from Great Britain. Many of them were arrested and executed right behind me in the prison. And we're about to take the tour. So come join us. In fact, leaders of the rebellions of 1798, 1803, 1848, 1867, and 1916 were detained and in some cases executed here. Fourteen leaders of the 1916 Easter Rising were executed by firing squad. Kilmainham Jail was decommissioned as a prison by the Irish Free State Government in 1924. It was restored from 1960 to 1971. The courthouse was in operation from 1820 to 2008 and is reopened as a visitor center. This recently uncovered flight of granite steps leads to holding cells in the basement. Please mind your head. Uh, floors are quite uneven, so please watch your step as you're walking. And also, we are using the staircase. The steps are quite warped and slippy, so for your own safety, I'd recommend holding on to the handrails. Uh, while we're inside, take as many photographs as you like, flash included, but we don't allow audio or video recording. Did he say no filming? The new East Wing was opened in 1864 and reflected the new ideals of Victorian prison theory. Each of the 96 cells is visible from a single vantage point on a central platform. Communication between inmates was forbidden, and they spent much of their time in solitary confinement in their cells. Meals were delivered to each of the three tiers by a pulley system, while movement was restricted by numerous devices, 
including a spiral staircase intended to prevent a charge by prisoners in the unlikely event that they managed to escape their cells. Hello, Ronald. Let me out. So this is one of our freshman dorms. <laughs> These are big cells. Yeah, these are Yeah, this looks like your freshman dorm. It's bigger than my room at home. When it was first built in 1796, Comanian Jail was called the New Jail to distinguish it from the old prison it was intended to replace. Originally, public hangings took place at the front of the prison. However, from the 1820s onward, very few hangings, public or private, took place here. A small hanging cell was built in the prison in 1891. There was no segregation of prisoners. Men, women, and children were incarcerated up to five in each cell, with only a single candle for light and heat. Most of their time was spent in the cold and the dark, and each candle had to last for two weeks. Its cells were roughly 300 square feet in the area. Until 1922, Dublin Castle was the seat of the United Kingdom government's administration in Ireland, which lasted 800 years. Most of the castle dates from the 18th century, though a castle has stood on the site since the days of King John, the first Lord of Ireland in the early 13th century. Originally built as a defensive fortification for the Norman city of Dublin, it later evolved into a royal residence, resided in by the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, or Viceroy of Ireland, the representative of the monarch. Over the years, Parliament and law courts met at the castle before moving to new purpose-built venues. It also served as a military garrison, Raised on songs and stories, heroes of renown, the passing tales and glories that once was Dublin town, the hallowed halls and houses, the haunting children's rhymes that once was Dublin city and the rare old time. Ring a ring a rosy as the light declines. I remember Dublin City in the rare old times. Our next stop was St. Patrick's Cathedral. St. Patrick was a religious figure who baptized Christian converts almost 1500 years ago. The cathedral was founded in 1191, and it's the national cathedral of the Church of Ireland, even though it lacks the key component of a cathedral, a bishop. According to its website, the cathedral is both Protestant and Catholic. Most of Ireland is Roman Catholic. With its 141-foot spire, St. Patrick's is the tallest church in Ireland and the largest. Construction on the current building began from 1220 to 1260 on the site of a 5th century church. In 1316, the cathedral tower was blown down by a storm. In 1362, part of the nave was destroyed by a fire. In 1537, the cathedral became an Anglican cathedral following the English Reformation. In 1548, the cathedral became a courthouse. In 1688, the cathedral was briefly repossessed by Catholic King James II during the Williamite Wars. There was major reconstruction in the 19th century. In 1916, the Easter Rising led to the temporary closing of the cathedral. Unfortunately, no original stained glass windows survive in St. Patrick's Cathedral. The oldest windows date from the middle of the 19th century. With both Christ Church Cathedral and St. Patrick's Cathedral, there was almost no precedent for a two-cathedral city. A confrontational situation persisted over the decades after the establishment of St. Patrick's and was eventually settled by the signing of a six-point agreement in 1300. The two cathedrals were to act as one and shared equally in their freedoms until 1870. Since 1870, the Church of Ireland has designated St. Patrick's as a national cathedral for the whole of Ireland. However, to this day, Christ Church is still viewed by the Roman Catholic Church as the primary official Dublin Cathedral.
The oldest monument in the building, a stone effigy in the North Choir Isle, is that of Folk de Sanford, Archbishop of Dublin from 1256 to 1271, the first Archbishop to be buried in St. Patrick's Cathedral. The church's most famous officer was Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels in the early 18th century. He was dean of the cathedral from 1713 to 1745. He is buried next to his longtime companion, Esther Johnson, aka Stella. He wrote his own epitaph, which roughly translated from Latin says, Here lies the body of Jonathan Swift, doctor of divinity and dean of this cathedral, where savage indignation can no longer lacerate his heart. Go traveler and imitate if you can, this dedicated and earnest champion of liberty, he died on the 19th of October 1745, aged 78 years. The Boyle Family Monument is a huge monument at the west end of the cathedral, which was erected in 1632 by Richard Boyle, first Earl of Cork, for himself, his wife, and his family. The size and position of the monument caused great offense to many, and it was removed and boxed in 1634. It was moved to its present position in 1863. We are here at Trinity College, which is based on Oxford and Cambridge, I believe. Trinity College is the sole college of the University of Dublin, a research university in Ireland, and so it's also referred to as the University of Dublin. The college was founded in 1592 and is one of the seven ancient universities of Britain and Ireland, as well as Ireland's oldest university. Women were admitted to Trinity College as full members for the first time in 1904. During the 18th century, Trinity College was seen as a university for Protestants. Catholics were first allowed to apply for admission in 1793, but with restrictions. From 1871 to 1970, the Catholic Church in Ireland forbade its members from attending Trinity College without permission. Built between 1712 and 1732, this is the long room at Trinity College's old library. The distinctive and beautiful barrel ceiling was added in 1860 to allow space for more works when the existing shelves became full. The library contains about 5 million books, including 30,000 current serials and significant collections of manuscripts, maps, and printed music. Marble busts of famous philosophers and writers line the central walkway of the nearly 200-foot long room. The Library of Trinity College is the largest research library in Ireland. As a result of its historic standing, the library is a legal deposit for the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and is therefore legally entitled to a copy of every book published in Great Britain and Ireland. In the 18th century, the college received the Brian Boru harp, one of the three surviving medieval Gaelic harps and a national symbol of Ireland. The Book of Kells is by far the library's most prominent book and is located in the old library. It's one of the finest and most famous of a group of manuscripts in what is known as the insular style, produced from the late 6th through the early 9th centuries in monasteries in Ireland, Scotland, and England. The Book of Kells contains the four Gospels of the Christian scriptures written in black, red, purple, and yellow ink. The name Book of Kells is derived from the Abbey of Kells in Kells County Meath, which was its home for much of the medieval period. The manuscript's date and place of production have been the subject of considerable debate. There are at least five competing theories about the manuscript's place of origin and time of completion. Many scholars place its origin at around 800 AD. It is certain, however, that the Book of Kells was produced by Columban monks. In the evening, there's only one thing to do in Dublin, hit the pubs, and there's plenty of them. She said, I think 
And the salt for me grog, me jolly jolly grog. The salt for me beer and tobacco. For I spent all me tin on the ladies drinking gin. Far across the western ocean I will wander. So we're sitting here in St. Stephen's Green in Dublin, and this is one of the main parks in Dublin. Uh, it opened in 1880, but in the late 17th century, uh, there was, this was marshland, and it was surrounded by a wall. And it was famous because of the Easter Rising of 1916, a group of insurgents took up basically camp here, and the British were across the street at the Shelbourne Hotel, and they were able to fire down the insurgents from there. So the insurgency didn't last too long. Uh, some of those men be, uh, basically were executed later. But today it's a nice park uh, in the 21st century. Based on this map, that is James Clarence Mangan, who lived from 1803 to 1849. He didn't live too long. We think we're on Grafton Street, which is one of the main shopping areas in Dublin. It's hard to see the signs. Oh, there's a sign right there. And that does not look like Gra we're on Grafton Street. Ronald, we're not there. Well, where is it? But this is a very cool area. Trinity College is that way. Yep, Trinity College is that way. But Loxetane is right there. What uh, is Where I get my soap at home. Very important. My brother's in charge of navigation, but he's doing a terrible job. Everyone in the world knows where Grafton Street is except him. Ronald, you know what city we're in? Good. All right, you got that right at least. All right, we found Grafton Street. This part is a pedestrian shopping street. Let's do it. What do you think of Grafton Street? I agree. Oh, they got a McDonald's! Shamrock Shake, anyone? It's a green McDonald's. They must have a Shamrock Shake. This is O'Connell Street, just north of the Liffey River. And that, I believe, is the tallest spire in the world. And this is our first uh, time we're walking to the north side of Dublin. And there are my travel companions. Apparently, you can go kayaking here, which is pretty cool. Right now, it's a little after 9 p.m. It gets dark around 10 which is nice. And I see a statue, gotta check it out. 
That's what I believe is going into Shona Island. That bird looks quite comfortable up there. World's tallest spire. Let's look at every inch as we go up to the top. I would say it's... Because uh, it's the world's tallest, that's why I care about, about it. It's 35 stories high, 350 feet is my guess. Can you build a spire like that? I, I don't think, think so. A spire to it. You don't even know what a spire is. <laughs> well, I don't know what a spire is, but I know that is a spire. I'm inspired to a spire. Right there now is a, a monument in his honor. There it was, Ute is wasted on the Ute. Now on the next junction here, now on the corner there, is the National Maternity Hospital. More people come out of that building than goes in there. Um, of beautiful Georgian buildings. That street was a residential street at one stage, but I'm afraid at this stage now, there's only five residential houses left on that street. All the rest of them have been converted into offices, clinics, embassies, colleges, restaurants. And the reason the railings were added within the 70s was back in those days, there was nothing in this country only on employment and immigration. And for Irish people to get work in America, they needed to have visas. Buildings here are known as the RDS, the Royal Dublin Society. In there we have concert halls, exhibition halls, demonstration halls, exam halls. We have indoor arenas and outdoor arenas. It's a very useful, a very versatile group of buildings. And if you do happen to win the lotto and you'd like to retire to this country, I highly recommend this street here on your right. Property on that street costs between seven and 37 million euros. It's called Shrewsbury Road. Now, do you want me to spell Shrewsbury in case you might need it? No. Okay, well anyway, you got to ask yourself how come property is so expensive in this area? Well, one of the reasons is that there are 19 embassies here within a half a mile. And you know as well as I do, civil servants don't mind spending our money. Today, when he began his journey in 1759. It all started for Arthur when he signed this lease we see before us for 9,000 years. Imagine signing a lease for 9,000 years. It's a very substantial commitment. But Arthur is a man of great vision. He was ahead of his time. If you look closely at the bottom right hand corner, you can see Arthur's signature. Now you might already recognize this signature because today it still appears on every Guinness can and bottle all over the world. For over 250 years we have been brewing right here on site at St. James' Gate and in fact up until the late 1980s, fermentation, the process where yeast is added into the brew, that took place right here in this beautiful building. We need water, barley, hops and yeast. Hundred thousand tons of Irish grown barley, that's a lot of barley. I
flight room. It's designed to make you more alert and to stimulate all of your senses. We believe that the more of the senses you indulge, the richer and more enjoyable your tasting experience will be. So today we're going to discover the character that lies within each glass of Guinness and why we truly believe that it is a beer that is made of more. Okay, so around the room we have our four different pods, each emitting an aroma from the four key ingredients found in Guinness. To my left here we have malted barley. Our malted barley is dried and germination and this is what gives Guinness its sweet flavour. Behind here we have our beer esters. Beer esters are produced during the fermentation process when yeast and hop extract is added. So this is the ingredient that gives Guinness its strong, like final form to the flavour. And people think this smells quite like caramel, so it is an enjoyable smell. So over here we have our hops, um, and that is quite a citrusy smell. So each of um, our glasses of Guinness has a high hop content and this adds to the bitter sweet taste you experience when you taste Guinness. So finally we have our roasted barley and we're very proud to say that we're the only brewery in the world of its size to roast all of our barley here on site. We roast it at a specific temperature of 232 degrees for two and a half hours and this is similar to the way a coffee bean is roasted so if you get the opportunity to waft in that aroma, it smells similar to dark chocolate and coffee. Okay, so each of these four ingredients are found in every single glass of Guinness, no matter how big or how adorably cute. Can I get an all for the little glass? But is anyone able to tell me what colour in fact it actually is? Ruby red. Ruby red. I'm going to give it to the man here. So we have a round of applause. It, you'll get two samples so you can drink that out and this is because Guinness releases its optimal flavour between 4 and 7 degrees Celsius or 41 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So in order to fully appreciate all the attributes and flavours Guinness has to offer, you need to use all the areas of your mouth. So the front of your mouth is used to taste the sweetness of the malt, the sides is used to taste the roasted barley and the back of your mouth is where it tastes the bitterness of the hops. Overall, you're going to get a smooth, rich, velvety kind of texture, which is known as mouthfeel. Oh, and also, just in the head of the Guinness is where a lot of the hops are. So we're going to try and bring our lips through the head, just so we don't get a really bittery taste. And we're going to experience all the other flavors as well. If we all just look behind here, that man on the wall. That is the only known portrait we have of Arthur Guinness himself. He was born in 1725 into a small brewing family just outside Dublin. He inherited £100 off his godfather, which he used to set up his own brewery in Kildare in Leedslip. And then he moved here to St. James's Gate in 1759 and he set up Guinnesses. And he married a lovely lady called Olivia Whitmore and together they had an astonishing 21 children, 10 of whom only survived to adulthood. Um, so when he passed, he left the brewery to his two sons, Arthur and Benjamin. The actual bell that was on the first liquid bulk carrier in the world, the MV Miranda Guinness, and it was used to bring Guinness from Dublin Port over to Liverpool. So um, when we ring this bell, we're going to have a huge cheer, because this is going to mean that we're all Guinness tasting experts. <laughs> You're more than halfway. You're just up there to you have failed. 
anywhere around there. It's an art, not a science. Well, I've got my certificate and I've crafted the perfect pint of Guinness. And here it is. Jameson Distillery, Jameson Whiskey, and there's plenty of it. just recently we opened it in the beginning of March, so it's all very new, but at the same time we've kept a lot of original features that were around in John James's time. For example, we have these wooden beams here that are hanging above our JJ's bar. We'll get the chance to check all that out again a little bit later as well. So we'll start with the name. John Jameson was our founder, and underneath our name you'll see our family crest with our motto, Sine Metu. Sine Metu is Latin for without fear. And this is a phrase that defined John Jameson's life and it has defined our whiskey ever since. While the many characters in the story of Jameson, there's only one founding father. It all started when the enterprise of John Jameson set up shop right here in Smithfield in 1780. Dublin was in the midst of a boom. Its population was growing dramatically. It was the second largest city in all of Great Britain and Ireland at the time second only behind London. It was also home to well over 100 breweries and distilleries, but many would fade away unfortunately in due course. I know that a few would realize that at the time, but the city was just about to gain an institution that would remain on its north side over two centuries later, and that was John James' distillery here on Bow Street. So John Jameson and his lovely, lovely wife Margaret, they really embraced the spirit of Sene Metu and each other as well. With a bit of hard work and innovation, the distillery continued to grow and grow. And so did the family along with it. They have 16 children all together. <laughs> Poor Margaret. <laughs> in time, one of the 16 children, John James II, he took over as master distiller, and the distillery continued to grow and thrive from there. Because you see, John Jameson, he really built upon the legacy that his father had entrusted to him. That of hard work, constant innovation, and unmatched quality. And then by the 1820s, the distillery was looking like this. Pretty nasty, if I do say so myself. And then between the years of 1880 and 1905, the distillery was running on all cylinders. Or, should we say pot stills. We'll see on the front of the bottle, there's two barrel men embossed in the glass. So these guys, these barrel men, they represent a hard worker's past and present of really built their whiskey from the ground up. And Bow Street in itself was really like a city within the city of Dublin. It was a bustling place full of highly trained craftspeople, and John James and his son had a very good reputation for being a good employer. So generally speaking, once you're hired here, you had a job for life. At its peak, the distillery employed about 300 people, and it supported hundreds of families throughout the city of Dublin. By the 1880s, the distillery was producing about 1 million gallons of whiskey every year, which is about 6.5 million bottles every year. So, John Jameson, the second is the son in the name John Jameson and Sons. And he was a master distiller in his own ranks. So we have his pocket notebook dating back from 1826 in which he recorded his experiments in distillation. In 2014, our archivist, whose name is Carol Quinn, she located this notebook among some old company records that had been packed away for safekeeping almost 40 years ago. When she saw the handwritten signature on the inside cover, and some notes that seemed to be about distillation, she showed the notebook to our retired head distiller, Barry Crockett. And Barry, he confirmed that these were indeed historic mash bills, or recipes, that date all the way back to 1826. She knew that her current head distiller, Brian Nation, would be very, very excited to get his hands on the notebook. But the notebook itself was quite fragile, so she first had to stand it for conservation in order to make it safe to handle. 
When the pages of the notebook themselves have been disbounded, out from the spine of the notebook fall barley grains have been trapped inside there since 1826. Our guess as to how that happens was John Jameson, he must have scooped up some barley grains in his hands and then stuck them in his pocket along with his notebook as they went about his daily business. And then here we see his writing. John Jameson was absolutely dedicated to perfecting the whiskey that came out of the Mississippi. He made notes on every single step of the process, the quality of the ingredients, the mix of the grains, the distillation process itself, the absolute control of every nuance of every element of making the best Irish whiskey. And these recipes, they've been handed down so that each successive generation can continue to innovate in the spirit of Sinemetu. Our whiskey masters at Middleton, they're using this notebook both to recreate these old recipes as well as to innovate new ones from them. And our whiskey masters down at Middleton, they oversee several processes that go into making every single bottle of Jameson. And today, I'm going to break this process for you guys down into three steps, which you'll see on this board behind me. The first step that we're going to talk about is preparing our ingredients. The great thing about Crown Support, where our Middleton distillery is located, is that it's nearby the two essential ingredients that you need to make a great whiskey. The first is having water. The word whiskey comes from the Irish word ishkabaha, which means water of life. The Dunborny River, which flows through our Middleton distillery, provides us with a life source of our whiskey making operation. The next ingredient that we use is barley. So we use barley that's generally grown within 100 mile radius of our Middleton distillery. In our first still, which we call the wash still, we take a wash, which is made from malted barley and unmalted barley, we put that in the wash still and then start to heat it. As the wash begins to boil, vapors, which are very, very high in alcohol, they begin to rise up through the neck. However, the freedom of the vapors is very short lived because they're then processed through a condenser and then are turned back to us as a liquid. And then, after a number of hours, the heating of the still stops and then the main body of water is left behind. Now, our next stop for us is going to be at our faint still. And the faint still is where we complete the second round of distillation. This distillate, this spirit, is getting closer, but still doesn't really have quite the same smoothness that John James was looking for. So John James, and bless you, he found that distilling OSB three times made it twice as still, or twice as smooth, sorry. So our last stop for us is going to be at our spirit still, and this is where we complete our third and final round of distillation. So by using these three copper pot stills, with our wash made of malted and unmalted barley, we just made what's known as pot still whiskey. And this is equal in the central style of Irish whiskey. Additionally, at our distillery in Middleton, we produce a second type of whiskey known as grain whiskey. This is called, well it's made with maize or corn, as well as malted barley, and we use a much more modern and efficient system called collar or continuous still distillation. But we actually are gonna get to drink some whiskey now. Woo! So, we'll, uh, we'll start with Jameson move on to leading Scotch whiskey, and then leading American whiskey, because America. So, uh, also guys, if anyone can tell me right now they prefer the Scotch or the American varieties, yes, it is right there. <laughs> Actually, on today, if you prefer American over the other two, that's okay. If you like Scotch, just get out. <laughs> Let's uh, go ahead and we'll pick up our glasses of Jameson in the center. So, pick up the so Jameson. And now before we drink the whiskey, the first thing I'd like for everyone to do is to take your glasses and then tilt them at a 45 degree angle. So, tilt those glasses. And now, we'll just gently roll the whiskey around on the side of the glass. And now, bring your glasses flat and hold it to the light. In theory, you'll be able to see some coating of whiskey on the, on the inside of the glass. And this is how you analyze for the legs of whiskey. So, the legs of whiskey. Uh, there are little droplets that are running down the inside of the glass, so you guys all should be seeing droplets in your whiskey. Or in Ireland, these droplets are also called tears, because things do get pretty poetic around here. <laughs> it's definitely the rain. <laughs> but if you have lighter or faster moving tears, it says this is going to be more light body whiskey. And same thing, if you have thicker, slower moving tears, it says it's going to be more oily, more full body. It's called introducing the nose. And now we're going for a longer and deeper smell, but a neat trick for smelling whiskey is to open up your mouth a little bit, and this is going to allow the aromas of the whiskey to pass through your nose. So do it just like this. This looks ridiculous, <laughs> and I understand it is, but I promise it works, <laughs> and it's not for all day. So, so go ahead and go for a long and deep smell of Jameson, and you get, you'll smell some oak, perhaps uh, some fruitiness from the sherry. All right, guys, I'm pretty sure I've tortured everyone long enough. So I say it's time for us to taste the Jameson now. So just take a little bit in your mouth. 
Hold it in there for a few seconds. Swirl around on your tongue and then swallow. So it's launch, everyone. Cheers. 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 Right, so what do you guys taste? <coughs> whiskey. <Spicy>. Whiskey. Is <laughs> there spiciness? Yeah. yeah. So the spiciness in this whiskey, so that comes from use of unmalted barley. Also, it enhances very smooth mouthfeel in the whiskey. So, I hope you guys also agree that it, it feels very smooth when you first taste it. And the smoothness also comes from our triple distillation process. Also, the vanilla that you smell or taste, the Christmas cake, the oak, so that all comes from the barrels that we use during maturation. So, it all, all the process, it all has a part to play in how our whiskey looks and smells and tastes. And our Middleton distillery is widely regarded as being one of the most advanced in the world, but at the same time, our traditions still take part of everything that we do. So you can have it with a bit of water, you can have it with ice, you can mix it as part of a cocktail. It's fantastic for mixing. There's really no right or wrong way to enjoy Jameson. Should I clean the palates? Also hydration. And now we'll move on to the Scotch whiskey. Simultaneously, this is where things are going to get cray. So... <laughs> So you smell the smokiness. Mm. Now compare that back to the Jameson. <laughs> so Jameson smells sweet. Really brings out the vanilla. Go ahead, go ahead and taste the scotches when you guys are ready. So taste that scotch. You can finish them off to your heart's content. But make sure to save some Jameson for later. And after you taste the scotch, compare that back to the Jameson. But Different. make sure to save that for the end. The reason why this whiskey tastes smoky is that in Scotland, some distilleries they burn turf or they burn peat. And then these are smoke to dry the barley during the malting process. So that's where that smokiness comes from. But the smoke is completely absent in our Jameson because we just use clean, hot air. It's a very clean tasting whiskey. Also, both these whiskeys, they are blends. But the difference is that, well, traditionally, blended whiskeys are different whiskeys blended from different distilleries. Jameson is a single distillery blend whiskey. So that means it's the only blend whiskeys we make ourselves that are in distillery. And therefore, we have full control, start and finish, we have the whole process. So the scotch is double distilled, whereas with Jameson is triple. So we get the extra smoothness coming from the third round of distillation. Mm. Woo. Woo. So, um, any Americans in the room? Yes. Raise your hand. <laughs> cool. I, I have to raise my hand on this one as well. <laughs> I've been here long enough to start losing my accent, but now I'm bringing it back today. <laughs> anyway, so we'll go ahead and we'll pick up the American whiskey and the Jameson simultaneously. So same exercise as before. Go ahead and smell the American. I came out wrong. Go smell the American whiskey. It's <laughs> different. <laughs> uh, smell the Jameson. Smell the American whiskey again. So I get it's it's sweet. It's perfumey almost. It smells like a bald eagle soaring through your nostrils. Go ahead and taste it when you guys are ready. They're all good. Um, can anyone guess a brand of the American whiskey this is, by the way? Jack Daniels. It is Jack Daniels, yeah. a national institution. <laughs> the main ingredient for making whiskey in America is corn or maize, so that's where the sweetness of this whiskey comes from. And also, a big difference between this whiskey and American whiskeys and Jameson and Irish whiskeys is that in America, it's common practice to mature whiskey every single time, a brand new or version of casks. So that brings a sense of woodiness to the whiskey. However, here in Ireland, at Jameson, we use casks that have already been seasoned. Stylistic choice. So, for example, for our Jameson original, we use both bourbon and sherry casks. So we get those influences coming into our whiskey. And again, pretty pronounced difference in smoothness between this two. So this American is single distilled, whereas with Jameson's triple. So we get the extra smoothness coming from the second and third rounds of distillation. On that note, for me, it's meaning that we have these three whiskeys side by side. So we have a single distilled American, we have a double distilled Scotch, and then triple till James. All right, so we finished the tour and we each get a free drink. Some people who are not 18 have a non alcoholic drink. Apple, it's it's apple juice is really Some funny. of us have scotch on neat on the rocks. And some of us real men have it straight, like me, John Jameson. I recommend it highly. All right. Real men have it with ginger ale and lime. Let's go. And real women, too. Lunch. A little legal. Real women have apple juice. Yeah. <laughs> And, All right. and wimps like me have uh, whiskey on the rocks. Although, actually, I drink it neat sometimes. I cheers. Smell and taste what is it? So, no, how do you say it? Cilantro. Cilantro. No, not cilantro. It's not cilantro. 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 Thank you. Cilantro.